Hello, today we are interviewing Hembuch Sagar, Professor of Policy Studies at the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Mr. Sagar, welcome and thanks for being with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. The scientific conference to prepare the Paris Climate Conference 2015 will take place this month in July. What roles do science and technology have to play in climate change and sustainable development on a global level? Science and technology actually play a very central role in both climate change and sustain, sustainable development challenges. Broadly, actually, you know, what the science does, it, it really helps us understand the nature of the problem, right? So, for example, in climate change, it's a science that's helping us understand that, you know, where global temperatures are going, the fact that uh, human beings are, or human activities are at, this, at the center of these climatic uh, uh, shifts, and, and also gives us an understanding of where things will go, mm -hmm. right? So in a sense, it really is a way for us to understand what the nature of the problem is and what it's likely to be in the future. And, and similarly, in other areas of sustain, sustainable development. Uh, what technology uh, does is it's, in a sense, it's part of the solution set. Uh, it's technology by itself is not gonna help us address these challenges, because these are very complex challenges. These are major, actually enormous challenges. But technology can help us. It's part of the overall menu of the solutions. So I think it's important for us to, to think about how to uh, really, um, I should say, uh, be able to utilize the potential that technology offers us. Uh, it's powerful. Uh, we can do a lot with it. And I think the question really becomes how to, how to do that right. And, but also be mindful of the fact, as I said, that this is only a part of the overall solution, it's, it's not a silver bullet, uh, and there are many other, these are basically uh, also social issues, uh, or issues that have a social basis to their, the origin of the problem, and therefore also the solution. So, so technology and science are important, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm at least very cautious to, to, to clarify that it's, it's one part of the overall, overall picture. Yeah, of course. When talking about environment, the question of energy rapidly comes to mind. The Coriolis Institute organized at Ecole Polytechnique all throughout the year a series of conferences on energy and environment. Could renewable energies become true alternatives, and if so, how? In a manner of speaking, we don't have a choice. I think where we are, uh, globally, energy demand is going to grow, especially in developing countries. Uh, I mean, the energy used in developing countries is really a small fraction of what it is in, in the richer countries. and. Uh, and we do know that energy use is very heavily correlated with uh, human and economic development. So, so these developing countries are going to uh, increase their energy use, uh, as they should. Uh, and so therefore, globally, the energy uh, demand is going to go up significantly. As it happens, the business as usual, which is a fossil-based energy system, is really not sustainable. Uh, Climatic you know, issues of, of climate change, the greenhouse gas emissions from the burning of fossil fuels, but also the other problems, the local problems of local air pollution and so on, are significant, the problems of extracting fossil fuels, you know, the social and the environmental costs of that. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's pretty clear that we are going to have to think about different ways of uh, making energy available to, to uh, people across the world. And, and therefore, renewable energy becomes a very important part of that portfolio. So I think, I think we have no choice but to increase uh, over time the use of renewable energy. Um, but what it does do, as in the case of any technology, is it's dependent on the performance of, of, of the renewable energy technologies. Are they going to be able to provide us energy in a way that is, uh, you know, does it provide us energy when we need it? And does it provide us energy at, at a cost that is comparable to that of other, uh, other energy sources? Uh, but one of the things here is that other energy sources actually have environmental externalities that are not priced. So while fossil fuels seem cheap, uh, the fact is the use of those fuels uh, results in these costs that are not included in the cost of the energy provided by those fuels. Renewable uh, energies actually don't have those costs, as, at least not as much. Uh, do have some small costs maybe, but uh, and so I think there uh, the question really becomes how do you compare the costs of the two technologies? Well, well, the traditional fossil and the renewable, and then 
the role of public policy here becomes very important in making sure that one is able to compare uh, the full costs of, of, the, two, of the two technologies and, and then until needed for renewable energy to be subsidized, uh, for people to be made comfortable with the use of these technologies, to invest in these technologies so the price goes down and the performance increases over time. So I think while we do need renewable energy to become an important part of the future portfolio, it again requires uh, investments both in research and development to make sure that these technologies become, uh, uh, as I said, uh, their performance improves and the cost comes down. And also to think about the kind of the broader Im implications of the application of these technologies. Um, so, you know, for example, thinking about as you ramp up the, the, the level of renewable energy in your energy systems, uh, they are intermittent and that has implications for the grid performance, for example. So yeah, there are other issues that need to get figured out. So I don't think renewable energy is overnight going to take over the energy system, but we've already seen in the last five or seven years a remarkable growth. And I think we are certainly going to continue to see that kind of growth driven by uh, climate and other, other constraints. Well, speaking of costs and investments, the Sustainable Development Chair at Ecole Polytechnique also organized a conference cycle on economists facing climate change. Shyama Ramani from the United Nations right. University uh, came and talked about the importance of taking into consideration the poorest populations when addressing the issue of climate change. Do you think that science and technology can help protect those populations when faced with the consequences of climate change? I think there are two different questions here. One is a question of how to protect the poor against the impacts of climate change. Uh, whether it is, for example, the impacts of coastal storms or flooding or droughts and all of that. I think, I think so that's a question of uh, a partly of adaptation. Can you help adapt? But there are going to be impacts that to which we're not going to be able to uh, adapt fully. And, and I think the question is, you know, how do you think about then protecting the poor in that, you know, do you think about insurance schemes, do you think about compensation, and so on and so forth. So that is one aspect of the question of how to um, uh, help uh, the poor deal with the impacts of climate change. I think the other piece is that, um, how do you make sure that uh, as we invest substantial amounts of energy and resources into, um, into, into addressing the climate problem. In doing all of that, we need to also make sure that we don't forget about the developmental challenges facing the poor, such as, for example, energy access. Uh, I think about two and a half billion people across the world don't have uh, access to a clean cooking energy. About a billion and a half people don't have access to electricity. Uh, and those kinds of problems must be addressed at the same time while we are addressing the climate, climate problem. Uh, the question is, can we actually provide modern, safe, uh, and clean energy to poor people in a way that's climate compatible? I think we can. But in some cases, for example, if you're talking about clean cooking energy, you may have to think about solutions such as uh, liquid petroleum gas that actually does have some climate emissions. But the, the emissions from these, from, from the energies of poor people is so small. So even if there's a small contribution to climate emissions, I don't think we should be worrying about that. Uh, I think, uh, so I, I do broadly agree with Shyama that, you know, as we think about climate, it should not become a constraint on providing uh, adequate and uh, clean energy to poor people. I think that's an absolutely important development imperative. And so I don't really see this as neither or. I think we have to take care of both of these things. So you uh, currently work at the IIT Delhi. You were previously a senior research associate at Harvard University, and you work on developing the exchanges between the US and India. How can dialogue lead to effective measures regarding climate change? And more generally, how can academic cooperation between institutions such as IITs in India, major universities in the US, Ecole Polytechnique, uh, lead to more measures, better measures regarding climate change? You know, climate change is a long-term problem. This is not going to get addressed overnight. Uh, but we do, for example, need to think about 
more creative policies to address the climate problem. It's, as you know, it's, it's a huge problem and we've not been able to make globally, uh, able to make the kind of progress that we really needed to. And uh, I believe what's absolutely critical here is uh, more creative, more innovative ways of thinking about how to get countries, uh, companies, and people to work together uh, to address this problem. And so I think that's academics can play an interesting role there. I think, I think drawing upon the research they do, drawing upon their creativity, they might be able to together craft solutions that can help us address uh, the climate challenge uh, more effectively. Uh, so I think that certainly is one possibility. The other one that I very much believe in is really is, uh, it's about uh, providing exposure to and, and training uh, the next generation of young scholars, right? And I think that's, um, in the coming years, it is these new crop of young people who are going to be engaged with the climate problem, are gonna be thinking about continuing ways to address the problem, which, which is gonna go on, you know, it's, it's, it's a long-term issue and it's, you're going to have to engage with it in a, in a longer term. And so I think, to my mind, these partnerships and these exchanges and these collaborations between uh, institutions across the world are absolutely critical to providing young people from all of these countries exposure to these questions, a chance to actually uh, interact with each other, to think together, to learn in each other's countries about how to uh, engage with these questions. Uh, I find uh, students in India very much really want to engage with these questions. I find students in the United States are very interested in these questions because they understand that it's part of their future. I'm sure it's the same about students here. So to me, um, I, I think there is both uh, a great opportunity, but I think also great responsibility to make sure that these students are given the kind of a training that will allow them in the coming years to, to really contribute to the solutions uh, to climate change. Mr. Sagar, thank you very much for being with us today. That's absolutely a pleasure. Thank you.